In the headlines, President Park Geun-hye calls on North Korea to come to the negotiating table once again in a New Year's press conference. World leaders join some 3.7 million people in France for an anti-terrorism rally days after Islamic extremists put the country under violence and fear, leaving 17 people dead. And the Korea Exchange opens its first carbon emission market on Monday, joining the government's efforts to curb greenhouse gas emissions to 30 percent below the usual levels over the next five years. Hello and welcome to Arirang News, coming to you live from Seoul. I am Kang Chede. Our starting point today, President Park Geun-hye's New Year's press conference. Uh, the president talked about how she plans to run the country in her third year in office, from inter-Korean ties to the economy to a reshuffling of the administration. Our presidential office correspondent Choi Yoo-sun takes us through some of the key points in her remarks. Addressing the nation on Monday, President Park pledged to lay the groundwork for peaceful unification on the Korean Peninsula, as this year marks the 70th anniversary of the division of the two Koreas with their liberation from Japanese colonial rule. As a means to improve inter-Korean ties, President Park expressed her hope for holding reunions for families separated by the Korean War around the time of the Lunar New Year holiday next month. The president then said she's open to talks with her North Korean counterpart as long as it would help the two Koreas peacefully unite. President Bak spent a large portion of her time talking about her economic innovation plan, saying this year will offer Korea a final chance to leap forward. She then told the nation she was sorry for the confusion that followed documents leaked from her office and vowed to ensure such acts are not repeated. Stressing how the prosecution has found no proof of her aides intervening in state affairs, the president said she has no plans to immediately replace any of them. As for a chief of staff, she said now is not the time to let him go. It's clear what President Buck's main goal is for this year, revitalizing the economy. But her firm position about her aides' alleged abuse of power and determination not to replace them anytime soon may deter parliamentary cooperation to secure legislative approval of the economy-related bills. Choi yoo Arirang News. Now, the word that was most repeated in the president's speech today was economy. That could reflect just how much the Park Geun-hye administration is focused on reviving and strengthening Korea's economic fundamentals. Our Lee ji tells us more. Carrying out reforms in various economic sectors is President Bach's number one priority this year. And those reforms are part of her three-year economic innovation plan, which she says will help keep Korea's low economic growth from falling into a long, drawn-out slump. In order to see such economic growth, the president said related entities such as trade unions and management must work together. As for the possibility of a cut in the nation's key interest rate, she plans to consult with macroeconomic policymakers to make a timely decision when needed. Easing regulations aimed at boosting the economy is also on the president's to-do list. 올해 2단계 규제 개혁을 
성공적으로 추진하고, 추진하고 나면 기업과 외국인 투자자들은 더욱 자유롭게 투자할 수 있게 되고. And she believes that will lead to creating more jobs and eventually reviving the economy. But whether these measures will prop up the economy in the end remains to be seen. Some skeptics point out that the president's policies lack provisions to really help those with heavy financial burdens. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Korea's National Assembly finally passed a special compensation bill for the victims as well as bereaved families of the 2014 ferry disaster on this Monday. The bill allows a committee under the Prime Minister's office to decide on specific terms of compensation. And a trauma center will be also be set up in Ansan, the hometown of the high school students most affected by this tragedy. Also, a resolution to to initiate a parliamentary investigation into overseas energy development projects by previous administrations that were found to have some irregularities, as well as a, a nearly a hundred other pending bills got legislative green lights today. South Korea and Japan have reached an agreement on their fishing quota in each other's exclusive zones for the next 18 months. Fishing is set to resume next week after six months of halt. Through June of this year, the amount of fishing will be an average figure of the past three years. And the new agreement, effective starting in July for a year, keeps both countries' fishing quotas at 860 ships and 60,000 tons. As for the most contentious parts of their negotiation, the New Deal allows Japan a test operation of a 199-ton fishing boat over the next five years, while South Korea can catch an additional 50 tons of cutlass fish from Japanese waters. Korea opened its carbon emission market today as part of uh, Korea's efforts to tackle climate change. Uh, we hear it was a rather thin trading on the first day, but it did end up seeing some upside at the end of the day. Our Kim ji tells us more. A carbon emissions trading market opened at the headquarters of the Korea Exchange in Busan on Monday. More than 500 business entities are participating in the market to buy and sell leftover emissions credits, much like a stock exchange. Around 1,200 tons of emissions credits were bought and sold during the first day of trading. The price for 15 Korea allowance units rose nearly 10 percent to around 8,600 Korean won, or roughly 8 U.S. dollars. One KAU is equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide gas. Through the trading system, Korea expects to reduce the amount of projected emissions by 30 percent by the year 2020. It will require continuous preparation and interest from business entities. Additional emissions quotas could be necessary if they're building additional plants. The government allocated nearly 1.6 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions to around 500 participating companies. This round of emissions credits expires in 2017. Companies releasing more than one ton of chemical substances are required by law to participate in the emissions trading market. Among the participating companies are some of the country's biggest conglomerates, including Samsung's Jail Industries and Hanha Fine Chemical Corporation. Korea is the seventh biggest carbon emitter in the world, releasing nearly 2 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Korea's labor minister has vowed to push ahead with sweeping reforms to the country's labor market. Lee gi Gwan says the government is particularly focused on preventing companies from exploiting temporary workers. Kim min -ji reports. The government is poised to radically overhaul the labor market. In an interview with Seoul-based Yonam News Agency, Yi gi Guan, the Minister of Employment and Labor, said the labor, management and government need to reach an agreement on how to reform the labor market by March. This as major labor-related laws will change this year. 
The push comes on the back of a high youth unemployment rate and a high proportion of temporary workers. The minister said advanced countries are modifying labor rules in response to the changing environment. But Korea still maintains laws and regulations drawn up when it was seeking rapid industrialization. While it is important to achieve a goal of 70 percent employment from around 65 percent now, the minister said firms should not hire temporary workers just for the sake of boosting the rate, nor should they exploit workers for cheap labor. He said reforms should be aimed at reducing the gap between workers in regards to wage and working conditions without cutting the number of jobs. He also called for a flexible wage and working hour system for workers approaching retirement, adding that a reward system should be based on performance and not seniority. Kim min Arirang News. Now, moving on to a developing story here in Korea. At least two workers died and four others were injured following a nitrogen leak at an LG display factory in Paju, north of Seoul. The leak was first detected a little before 1 p.m. on this Monday as uh, workers there were uh, doing repair work on the building. Authorities say that one of them died at the scene, while another was pronounced dead as he was uh, being transported to the hospital. Hospital. One of the four injured workers is in critical condition at a local hospital while the rest are being treated for minor injuries. We will uh, bring you more on the story as things develop. With the largest number of golf simulators anywhere in the world, screen golfing is big business here in Korea. And now in the city of Daejeon, a golf theme park opened and it's, uh, it has its eyes on becoming a global golf landmark. Kwon Suwa has the story. It's a paradise for golfers, indoors and outdoors alike. A golf theme park in the central city of Daejeon has opened for golf lovers of all ages. The park boasts upgraded screen golf facilities that make virtual indoor golf more real than it's ever been before. I like that you can play on real grass. It's better to practice here than at other indoor facilities because my shots feel more precise. The new space not only offers fun for the whole family, but also gives opportunities for young players who want to hit the big time. The park has a special training academy with simulation golf competitions that should help foster the next generation of Korean golfing superstars. And that's not all. Various cultural activities can be enjoyed for residents and visitors all across the nation and the world. There will be a space for performances like musicals too. We are looking forward to welcoming Koreans and foreigners who want the total golf experience. Korea's screen golf industry is only around 10 years old, but it has grown rapidly with three and a half million people playing every year. With the new golf park, Korea hopes to swing into a new K-wave on the golfing screen. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. On this week's Industry Insight, we take a look at a local e-commerce startup that has broken away from the rest and to become one of the country's leading online retailers. It's called Coupang, and its innovative strategies and breakneck growth have attracted investors from home as well as from abroad. Connie Lee tells us more. It's a click-click here and a click-click there. And whether it's a box of diapers, a bag of coconut flakes, or a new winter coat, you can get the item delivered right to your door before the end of the day. It's all done through Coupang, which promotes itself as the country's leading e-commerce company. The four-year-old company has grown quickly. In January 2011, it recorded a million subscribers and around 270 million U.S. dollars in transactions that year. But today, there's around 25 million subscribers, with last year's transactions projected to be about $1.8 billion. Most shoppers use its mobile app, which was the number one shopping app last year, beating out competitors like We Make Price and Ticket Monster. 
Coupang started out as a daily deal site by Harvard grad Bum Kim, but is now a full-fledged e-commerce company with more than 2,000 employees who enjoy an open office space in Seoul that looks like it belongs in Silicon Valley. The Korean startup has attracted U.S. investors and most recently raised $300 million from a group led by BlackRock. Investors point to Coupang's same-day service model, mobile expertise, and online offerings as the features that make the company one to watch. Coupang says it knows how to learn the customers, especially to its mobile app. You may think the secret is simply behind the design and layout, but in fact, there's a lot of technology and research that goes into this. We were able to keep up with that. The company also says there's nothing like its end-to-end -end customer service, which involves using its own delivery personnel, including the coupon man. The coupon man does not fly, but his services are compared to that through the company's so-called rocket delivery. This may be the key to getting repeat customers. It went from buying just necessities and grew into just buying basically everything. I met with one avid user. So a lot of times I'm not home when they're delivering something, but they always send me a message. They even take a photo, and then they send me the text message. This is where we left it. So I'm almost 100% sure I'm going to be getting the item that I received, which actually hasn't been the case when I've used other services. Coupang has even given new life to businesses that have partnered with it. This online shopping mall, which specializes in trendy feminine pieces, has seen its annual sales increase 20-fold after partnering with Coupang to sell its items. The marketing and promotion of my brand through Coupang was incredible. It led me to sell 10,000 items in a day. I have now expanded my business and created another brand. As for Coupang's future, well, it says it wants to solidify its position as a top online retailer here in Korea and expand its delivery service before branching out to the world. We hope that one of these days, people will look back and ask themselves, how do we ever live without Coupang? Connie Lee, Arirang News. Indonesia confirms the recovery of one of the black box recorders from the Air Asia passenger jet that crashed more than two weeks ago. Paul E is joining us from the news center. Paul, this of course is a welcomed development for many, from the families, grieving families, to the search crews that's been that been uh, working day and night there. But it looks like they're still missing a vital piece of this black box. That's correct. Indonesia's search and rescue agency said that Navy divers were able to retrieve the flight data recorder on Sunday in the waters off the coast of Borneo. However, the cockpit voice recorder remains under the sea, along with the wreckage of Flight 8501. Officials say they have pinpointed the location of that voice recorder based on its underwater pings, and they plan to recover it as soon as possible. The recovered flight data box landed in Jakarta on this Monday, where contents will be analyzed over the next few weeks. The flight data recorder will be placed in a special case containing seawater. It will be brought to Pankalamban to be cleaned it up and replaced with fresh water. Then we will bring it to the National Transportation Safety Committee Laboratory in Jakarta for a further investigation process. They says the families of the fallen passengers and crew continue to wait in Surabaya for the results of that examination, which may shed light on the cause of this deadly accident. International forensic experts are working around the clock to identify the victims' remains. Only 48 bodies out of the total 162 people on board have been found. Among them, 32 have been identified, including a couple from Korea traveling with their 11-month-old daughter. Mm. Now let's turn to Paris. A massive unity rally has taken place in the French capital to honor the 17 victims of last week's terror attacks. And this was a historic moment. It's estimated that over 3 million, 3.7 million is the latest figure that I heard, rallied across the country. And many world leaders also came out in an act of solidarity. That's right. Dozens of heads of state joined the march on Sunday, linking arms and vowing to protect the ideals that have come under attack in recent days. This amid some of the tightest security the world has ever seen, as France remains on its highest state of alert. Our Son Jung-in has more. 
French officials have described it as the largest march in the country's history. An unprecedented number of people, estimated to be more than one and a half million, took part in a unity march in Paris, holding Je suis Charlie or I am Charlie signs. The rally, led by relatives of the victims, began on Sunday afternoon at the Place de la République. And I think that uh, we all have to fight for the values of our uh, democracy, of the republic, and uh, that's why I think it's really important to be here today. The march was held in response to the cold-blooded killings that began last Wednesday in the French capital when two brothers, Said and Sharif Kawachi, raided the offices of the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. It ended on Friday with the brothers and another gunman, Amity Koulibaly, being shot dead by police, but only after more people had lost their lives. In total, 17 innocent people were killed during the three days of violence. Thousands of police and soldiers were deployed to maintain security and protect those taking part, including more than 40 world leaders. French President François Hollande joined the rally, linking arms with leaders from Germany, Italy, Turkey, Britain, as well as Israel and the Palestinian territories in act of solidarity. The rally was held as more details of the terror attacks emerged. A video of Amadi Koulibaly appeared on the Internet on Sunday, in which he pledged allegiance to the group that calls itself Islamic State. In the seven-minute clip, he said the attacks were meant to cause fear across France and were in retaliation for foreign forces targeting IS militants in Iraq and Syria. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And those are unity rallies for the Paris terror victims extended actually across the globe from Sydney to Cairo and Hollywood is not an exception. It's the biggest stars are also speaking out. And Paul, the Golden Globes kicked off in uh, Los Angeles on Sunday and it looks like many there took that opportunity to show, show their support. That's right. Well, there was an outpouring of condolences on the red carpet, as well as speeches to pay tribute to the victims of these Islamic militant attacks. So it's definitely a much more somber tone this year in what is usually one of the more festive awards ceremonies. Actress Helen Mirren showed her support by wearing a pin declaring Je suis Charlie, while Jared Leto spoke in French to show solidarity with the satirical cartoonists who were gunned down. Actor George Clooney praised the millions of people who rallied not just in Paris, but around the world calling it an extraordinary day. They were Christians and, and Jews and Muslims. They were leaders of countries all over the world. And they didn't march in protest. They marched in support of the idea that we will not walk in fear. We won't do it. So, je suis Charlie. Thank you. Later in the ceremony, Theo Kigma, the president of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, stressed the importance of standing united against those who would repress free speech anywhere from North Korea to Paris. Mm. But let's not uh, forget uh, the party mood of uh, the Golden Globes. Uh, this is the first major award show of the year for the Hollywood film industry, which sort of sets the stage for the Oscars next month. So give us a rundown of some of the big winners of the night. Well, the coming-of-age story Boyhood took the coveted Golden Globe for best drama, but in an unexpected winner was director Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel for best comedy or musical, which took the wind out of the season favorite Birdman featuring Michael Keaton. Low-budget experimental film Boyhood took home three Golden Globes on Sunday night, including best director, with Patricia Arquette honored for her role as best supporting actress. Many thanks to our visionary director, Richard Linkletter, for allowing me to be part of something so human, so simple, and groundbreaking and significant in the history of cinema. Thank you for shining a light on this woman and the millions of women like her, and for allowing me to honor my own mother with this beautiful character. The outcome of the 72nd Golden Globes is not expected to influence the Academy Awards, which will be hosted on February 22nd. That's because voting for next week's nominee announcements was already closed, but critics say it could give some clues on who's been tipped for the next Oscars. Chetty? All right, Paul, thank you so much. Good stuff there, and we will see you again in just about two hours.
Hello and happy Monday. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather forecast. We kicked off the week under moderate temperatures and clear skies due to a high pressure front from China. Now, um, it looks like most regions will be done with cold waves for a while as numbers are set to jump above seasonal averages from tomorrow afternoon. However, it may be a different story for those in the Gangwon-do and Gyeonggi-do provinces as brisk cold conditions are set to continue through tomorrow morning. Otherwise, air conditions continue to remain very dry over on the eastern coastline where dry weather advisories have been issued. On to tomorrow's readings. Seoul starts off the day at minus 6 before reaching 5 in the afternoon. Daegu and Gwangju 9, Busan hits 11. On to other regions. Daejeon hits 6, Jeju reaches 11, Gokdo 8, Mount Kumgang peaks at 0. Those are the updates we're following at this hour, but more coming up after 10. All right, see you then. Thank you very much, Bo Gyeong, and that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.